Hi, um, my name is Father Rob Carbono. I'm a passionist uh, priest. Uh, I'm in Scranton, Pennsylvania, and I am historian for the Passionist Congregation. I coordinate the uh, Passionist China Collection, which is part of the larger Passionist Historical Collection, which is based physically at the University of Scranton in Scranton, Pennsylvania, where I'm adjunct uh, professor of history. I'm also an affiliate scholar, a uh, research uh, archivist at the Ricci Institute for Chinese Western uh, Culture uh, and History at uh, the University of San Francisco. And um, I, I, I approached uh, Dr. Anthony Clark from Whitworth uh, University after, I guess I was one of the first people in the interview process of Christianity in China scholars. And as this process went, uh, started to proceed, uh, he was telling me that various people were lined up for this. And I asked him, well, someone should interview you about what this, what did you learn from this? Because this is such a rich aspect and it sort of took him by surprise, but uh, we put together a couple questions that I wrote. And uh, I think for anyone who sees these interviews over a period of time, whether you see this before you actually watch interviews or maybe after you've seen a couple, this might uh, illumine some of the perspectives and uh, we gain certainly the wisdom of uh, Dr. Uh, Anthony Clark who did the interviews and it's worth always getting that because sometimes as an interviewer, you have many things going through your mind but you remain uh, quiet to let the voice emerge but that doesn't mean your mind's not working at least most of the time. So um, the first question is, uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce you and, and ask you if you have any starting comments on this uh, process. Well, I mean, uh, goodness, um, just first by way of a starting comment, thank you for doing this. This is uh, a, another unexpected a chance to provide a few remarks about this, this interview series. Um, and again, just to say how grateful I am for you, to, to you and, and honored to uh, have to meet with you again. But other than that, um, I guess we could just get going. Okay, maybe uh, what was the reason these interviews of China scholars were done? Can you give us a background on this and how did it begin and what, what, how? Yeah, you know, uh, three, I guess, um, three events and realizations coalesced uh, over the past several months that really inspired the series. Uh, the series, I mean, I'll, maybe I'll say this again later, but the series, this interview series, um, uh, is co-sponsored by Whitworth University and the, the China Christianity Studies Group, which is an affiliate of the Association for Asian Studies. And so uh, just a small group of us um, thought about three different things that inspired this series. And one is the realization that this field is, is still young, the, the field China Christianity Studies, which includes um, Sino-Western relations, it includes history, it includes theology, it includes philosophical exchange, even scientific exchange. But this field is quite young. I think it emerged probably at least in North America and the West as a field in the 1980s. Uh, and then it's growing in popularity right now. So the first thing that uh, I know some of some people have been discussing lately is, is a realization that um, this is at this point very much a field. Uh, and it's, it's a, a rigorous scholarly field that, um, that is growing in popularity. So we wanted to preserve the voices of some of the main contributors to this field. And second, uh, what kind of inspired this was that um, there was a, a death, a two, two recent deaths. One is by uh, Daniel Bayes and the other was uh, Gary Tiedemann. Uh, my, my cat is entering into, perhaps entering into the the, the, the screen here, but uh, but uh, with the with the passing of Daniel Bayes, who was instrumental in founding this field, really, and then Gary Tiedemann in London, who was a great contributor to this field, uh, there was a, 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 a not a not exactly a panic, but a sense that many of it basically highlighted that we are in a liminal moment uh, in the field, a liminal space. That is, many of the foundational scholars are in a late season. And uh, uh, there was this sense that uh, we wanted to preserve as many uh, of the sort of foundational voices as possible at this time. Also, we are at this 
particular moment wherein we have this global pandemic and the global pandemic is, has uh, meant that modes of communicating through the internet uh, ha have become normal and normative. And we realized that video conferencing has become common and that this is the moment wherein we can record uh, these interviews with prominent scholars just from wherever we are. And also we're all essentially stuck. <laughs> um, one of the things uh, I've heard quite a lot during this interview series is uh, how would this have happened otherwise? I mean, uh, in the past, I think we would have envisioned uh, an interview series with, with prominent scholars in this field. We would have envisioned it as something wherein I or some interviewer travels and, and meets the, the person in, in person. And, and that would have required an, a really ex, an enormous budget. Um, so, so this idea of realizing the field is young, the field, uh, 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 there are still people who are foundational in the formation of this field. These voices need to be preserved, realizing too that some are in, the, in sort of a last season and we wanted to be able to uh, sort of capture their stories. And then some time ago, and I should just, by way of uh, outlining a, a brief history, some time ago I had a discussion with uh, Professor Joseph Ho, who is the present director of the China Christianity Studies Group, um, which is a scholarly group affiliated with the Association for Asian Studies. Uh, he and Whitworth University are essentially co-sponsoring this series so that we'll collaborate in archiving the interviews and uh, giving, providing access to the interviews and um, doing all of the technical dimensions in terms of having credits in the beginning and the end and, and uh, uh, creating these, 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 uh, uh, the, these discrete uh, inter filmed interviews. That was a collaborative venture. And, and one of the things that really uh, came to mind as we were thinking about this series that inspired it is not only that we need to preserve these voices, but by just a last point, that is we still are in a moment where there are still some scholars who don't quite, I guess, recognize that China Christianity studies is a legitimate field or is a, is a genuine field. And uh, in, in speaking with people and speaking with Professor uh, Joseph Ho, uh, we realized too that in the 1980s, I think it was 1983, the, the China Christianity Studies Group, then called the China Missions Group, was founded. The, the Association for Asian Studies Board then uh, did not recognize that this field existed. And then a number of scholars, uh, uh, John Fairbanks from Harvard, um, uh, uh, Paul Cohen, uh, certainly Jonathan Spence was one of these voices at, at Yale, came to the fore and argued that there are few fields more important than China Christianity Studies. Um, one of the things they said uh, was that in the, in the realm of archives, you have the archives of diplomats and missionaries. Um, most scholars look at the archives of diplomats, which has the fewest amount of documents. Missionaries provided a much larger documentation of the history of, 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 of what's happening in China about things beyond Christianity. So it was those scholars who said this field needs to exist. And, uh, um, and, and as they provided support for the field to exist. The Association for Asian Studies acknowledged it as a field, 1983. Um, Kathleen Lodwick was very important in founding it. And we wanted to, to preserve these, these, uh, these uh, interviews at this, I think, really convenient moment. So that really is the sort of genesis of this project. Hey, um, thank you. For someone who knows nothing about Chinese Christianity, what is the most important aspect to pay attention to as they listen to and watch? And I guess in framing this question, I was thinking that uh, this is an aspect probably I'm thinking of students first, or maybe depending on the access, people who, who might have a wide breadth of interest in China, but the religion aspect or even they might be anti-religion even, uh, and they, they might have a bias coming to these interviews. Uh, and all of a sudden, you know, you, we have all these voices, multiple voices. What's your advice uh, after doing these, mm -hmm. that how a person should listen or um, utilize the resources of voices that you were listening to? What's yeah. the symphony they'll hear? I really like this question. This question is, is one that, um, 
was very much background music in my own mind as I conducted these interviews. That is, why do these interviews matter, especially to uh, the various groups who will be um, perhaps watching these interviews or listening to these interviews? Um, and I, and I, I imagine that there are two fundamental groups who might watch or listen to these interviews, and that would be non-scholars uh, who are simply interested in the topic of Christianity in China. Or maybe they're interested in, in, in the scholarly view of Christianity in China. And then there's another group of, of, of scholars, perhaps, who don't specialize in the history of Christianity in China. And, and you, you mentioned this, Father Carboneau, um, you know, the, the non-specialists, maybe there'll be a bias. Certainly, that, I think that exists. Um, and then there will be scholars of this field who will, who will certainly want to watch these interviews. But for the non-scholars, for people like students or just interested uh, persons, um, what would I recommend to them? Well, um, I would say uh, for those who are non-specialists and non-scholars, I think that it would be helpful to pay particular attention to the personal stories of those who are interviewed. Um, I'm thinking of your own marvelous stories of, uh, of, of being with another passionist and hearing gunfire and uh, uh, helping to uh, relocate a, a cemetery and, and, and the experiences that you had. But, but there are a lot of insights uh, that these scholars have had that I would call on the ground realities uh, of Christians in, in China. Um, so I would pay particular attention to the stories. Also, uh, for the, for the non-specialist scholars, um, well, if, if, a, if, a, if a scholar of China or East Asia were to pay particular attention to the methodologies and the materials upon which this field relies, there's a lot to be learned. Um, and I'm thinking of, of all of the scholars in this field have at some level had to confront the issue of language, right? Um, I could go back to that later, for, perhaps. But, uh, and all of, all of the scholars in this field ha have had to confront the issue of, of archives and of text and, and negotiating with two very disparate cultures and, and, how, and, and, how we, um, and how we imagine and learn from this, these encounters, right? But for the, for the non-specialist, I think there's a lot to learn. I mean, scholar, non-specialist, there's a lot to learn from, about, from how those of us in this field approach the field, um, our methodologies. There's a lot to, I think there's a lot that one could pay attention to. I mean, certainly one could pay an awful lot of attention to what, what materials we use, um, whose works we read. Uh, and, and in terms of science, you know, I'm thinking of, I'm thinking of the Jesuit mission and how they were bringing texts like Euclid and all of these scientific works and anatomy uh, charts and translating them into Chinese and the challenges of that, that cultural translation, translation and that linguistic translation. This scientific and cultural exchange is, is an exchange that one finds within China Christian or China mission archives that I think the non-specialists could learn a lot from. And, um, and, 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 and finally, um, I should say too, this, this is sort of a, a tangent a bit, but um, finally, uh, as was expected, there, the technology at times in this, in this uh, interview series uh, was not always perfect. I mean, uh, there were times where we lost signal and had to reconnect and times where the camera froze and times where one camera didn't work at all. So uh, you just see two photographs and you just listen to the, you just listen to the, the interview basically as an audio file. Um, and then one instance where the text is literally just written. So, uh, but by and large, most will be, as you see this, uh, uh, two scholars meeting and, and, and recorded. So uh, it, it, the, I guess the enterprise itself is, is imperfect. Uh, and there's something delightful about that, right? Um, yeah, I guess I, I, those are the, the, the main contours of what, how I would answer that question. Um, that's good. Uh, we'll go on to the third question. Explain how this was a personal experience from you, for you. What surprised you, humbled you, and inspired you? So maybe just the personal aspect and, and um, you know, the surprise, humility, uh, how, 
this must have been a pretty interesting experience to go through. Right. Uh, well, I mean, the, the beginning thing, the first thing I would say is um, the, the amount of work that went into this was just extraordinary. I, I, I've written books and books take years and it feels like I fit several years of work in just a few months. Uh, uh, the, the technology alone for me was a high learning curve. I'm, I'm someone who likes books and fountain pens, and suddenly I'm dealing with Zoom and how to record. And uh, for some, this is very easy. For me, this was a very challenging thing. But I think the one thing that really, that be, the first thing that struck me, and this is the, probably the question I might spend the most uh, time on, but um, what really struck me is uh, how humble, how humbling, it is to see senior scholars be as humble as they are. Humility is humbling. Uh, and, and, uh, uh, and, and, and seeing, I hadn't even thought about bringing this topic up, but before each interview, I would meet with the interviewee for a brief few moments, sort of chat, you know, set the tone, and then, and then press record and begin the interview. Um, one of the recurring themes was people saying, gosh, I am terribly nervous. And this would be someone who is one of the most renowned scholars in the field saying to me, I'm terribly nervous, or I couldn't sleep last night. Um, uh, uh, and that was quite astonishing to me. Uh, I personally was quite nervous uh, uh, in, in preparation for even this uh, meeting. I, I wasn't really nervous doing the interviews, but I was quite um, astonished and excited and quite honored to uh, be able to interview and hear the stories of persons whose books have been on my shelves for decades. Mm -hmm. um, there is something about admiring someone's work and then having a chance to hear their story that was, that was, that was quite exhilarating. And, um, and I, did not, I didn't expect how many hours I would spend each day in preparation. I mean, the hours of preparing the technology the hours of uh, 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 the hours of looking into some details for just a thirty second or one minute introduction to a scholar uh, that took a, an awful lot of time and then and then honing up uh, uh, honing my my sense of their scholarship so that if they brought something up, uh, I would know what what uh, what that particular scholar uh, was thinking or talking about so it was a, a, a lot of collective time spent in preparation. And finally, as you know right now, it's quite interesting to just sit and listen to uh, someone else sort of talk about their story or talk about their ideas or their thoughts. So it, uh, I, would, I was surprised, I never anticipated how many hours I would spend just sitting, uh, drinking coffee or tea and listening to scholars recount their stories. So surprised. Um, one of the things that surprised me is that senior scholars, and I would say uh, the junior scholars less so than the senior scholars. Um, junior scholar, I remember myself as a junior scholar. Um, I, I remember thinking, uh, uh, boy, I really know my topic. I'm really good at this, right? And, and the longer I'm in my field, the less confident that I am. That, that's just an, an interesting thing. So the most senior scholars I interviewed spoke the most either before the interview or after the interview about their weaknesses as a scholar. Well, that was surprising to me. I mean, I remember um, hearing at least three of probably the most published scholars say to me before the interview, you know, my language skills are terrible. Um, I really have a hard time reading Chinese. And, uh, and, and, and I thought, I was the only person who felt like I have a hard time reading Chinese. You know, it's one of those things I never wanted to admit. But here are these senior scholars saying, um, "Boy, I just feel terrible with my Chinese skills." And uh, 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 and then and then one other thing that really surprised me was that uh, was how many of the the scholars, especially the senior scholars, uh, had met people that we read about in history texts. For example, um, some scholars, uh, and I'll, I won't give away too much who, because I wanna inspire them to listen to the interviews, but uh, you know, one scholar was at a banquet with Joe and Lai, 
during the Cultural Revolution. And, and, and I'm certainly thinking, you know, this is, I personally have not had the opportunity to be at a banquet with Zhou Enlai and, and some of these, you know, Hua Guofeng or you know, these famous figures. Um, one scholar was very, very close personal friend with Francis Rouleau. And, uh, and, uh, and in the interview had a, a signed photograph of Francis Rouleau, the famous Jesuit who worked on the rights controversy, sort of behind, behind as, as, uh, as the interview uh, happened. Uh, scholars talking about what eating jello and something else with uh, John Fairbanks and Jonathan Spence and, and New Haven and, and that in the Northeast and, and talking about how, you know, as they're eating jello and clam bake or something, uh, they're talking about the importance of the field of China Christianity studies. So um, it was, it was a, a kind of interesting to hear uh, these, these personal stories uh, and, and, and to be surprised by um, to be surprised by how um, many really incredibly uh, important, significant historical people were part of this process, right? Um, and then what humbled me? Well, again, I mean, what humbled me was the humility that I encountered. Uh, I, I think it will be, uh, for those who watched, and here I will mention a few names, um, I think it will be evident, you know, to uh, those who watch the interview series that people like uh, Professor Robert Entenmann, who, who has advanced Parkinson's, uh, uh, agreed to be interviewed. And as he was uh, uh, being filmed, you can see the Parkinson's uh, uh, obstructing his ability to uh, express uh, some ideas. And, um, and, and I would say it was tremendously, tremendously humbling to see Professor Entenmann uh, care so much about this topic and, and, and uh, struggle with his Parkinson's to express what were some marvelously insightful uh, answers. So it was humbling to see that. Um, I mean, I'm thinking of uh, uh, Theodore Foss, who spoke about his long history of collecting books and materials. And then, um, and then after the interview, reading some private correspondence he'd had with really significantly important people. And, um, and then I, I'm me thinking, well, why didn't we talk about this in the interview? But that was quite, quite humbling. Um, I'm thinking of Joseph Lee, for example, who, uh, who when I asked him, you know, why did you get into this field? Uh, uh, Joseph Lee was recollecting on his own family history. And then there was a, a, a Lee village in, in southern China. Half the village was Baptist and half the village was Catholic. And uh, talking about how you know he's an emerging scholar, and he, like me, wasn't originally thinking of going into uh, China Christianity studies, but the history of his own family and his own village really moved him and inspired him to to go into the field. It was humbling to hear about this family history, and humbling to hear from from uh, Joseph Lee about his own advisor, who was Gary Tiedemann, uh, and and how. Uh, Gary interacted with him as a as a as a doctoral candidate as a doctoral student. Um, so that was quite humbling. I, I'm thinking of Paul Rule. Uh, Paul uh, Paul is certainly among the scholars who I've uh, I've only met in person once, but uh, when I hold his Acta Pecanensia translation that he worked on with Claudia von Kolani, who I just interviewed. Uh, when I hold these massive volumes of text, and I think about the industry that it, that was required to that was required to produce uh, this scholarship, it's just intimidating to me. Um, and and asking him, how did you get into this field? Uh, and, and I'm going to be very limited here. He's taught. He he recalls how when he was a young boy, his father uh, played tennis with the Australian Columbans. Uh, and these Columbans, right? I mean, they played tennis with Paul Rule's dad, and these Columbans had this really rich China uh, mission. And uh, one day, you know, young Paul Rule is invited to go to the Columban residence, where he's taken to the room where they have all of their their China mission objects sort of on display, and he's talking about a model of a village and Chinese Christian art, and how that sort of planted a seed of interest in 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 this in this topic. Um, that was quite humbling to see how the seeds of a scholarly life can begin with a very humble experience, such as, you know, a dad who plays tennis with, with these, 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 these Columbans. And then um, humbled, uh, quite humbled by Li Ji, 
uh, a mainland China scholar who, uh, who, who uh, there were a couple of scholars or several scholars who identified themselves. And I think this was, and they were Chinese scholars. And it, I thought it was very interesting to note that it, through the interview, and you know, you know, when you watch the interview series, you'll, you'll see this. That is, they make it very clear that they're non-Christian, but care deeply about the history of Christianity in their own culture in, in China. And uh, Li Ji, it was quite humbling to hear from her how as a non-Christian, uh, she feels like her scholarship is a gift to the marginal voices of Christians in China. So mm -hmm. in a way, she's uh, spending an enormous amount of work to give voice to marginalized voices, the very, I mean, less than 2% of Chinese are Christian. That was very humbling to me. And hearing about how she would go to Chinese Christian villages during her work, and they would warmly welcome her into the village. And she showed some photographs during her interview of her with these villagers, and they're, they're quite, quite moving. Um, and, uh, and then also, I, I, I should say, even you know, speaking with you about, about uh, uh, working to relocate this, this uh, Catholic cemetery, that was quite humbling to me because I would have been terrified. Um, and here you are, uh, and, and you reveal this, sort of exchanging uh, 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 money under the table over a meal. Uh, to me, uh, <laughs> that's quite humbling because that's, that's beyond scholarship. I mean, that's a contribution to a community. Um, I, I definitely view you, Father Carbono, as a scholar and as a priest, as a friend. But, uh, but, but to see how um, uh, all of those dimensions of who you are were, were translated into helping this community to preserve these, these cemeteries, that was, that was quite humbling. Um, inspired. Uh, boy, I, I just have to say I was inspired by the energy and the industry of, of these scholars. I'm thinking of John Paul Wiest, who, who uh, has, and I've mentioned him uh, in, uh, in, in the past, but how John Paul Wiest is, is definitely, um, as he says, slowing down. I should say many of the uh, more uh, senior scholars have said to me, I'm slowing down. They seem to be the ones who are slowing down the least, <laughs> actually. I mean, John Paul Wiest is, uh, he's working on this enormous uh, metadata project on the Samus collection. Uh, I, I can only imagine someone in her or his 20s working on such a, a demanding project. But here he is working on this huge project. Uh, Paul Mariani is continuing his work on contemporary Chinese church. and and. That inspires me in a way because uh, the, 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 the contemporary church in China is, is that, as the Chinese say, uh, it's comparatively sensitive. Um, and it's something that I've always thought, oh, I just prefer the Qing dynasty. But here he is working on a topic that there's a lot of pushback. And you know, one asks questions of prudence and imprudence. But here he is, you know, forging forward. I think of Cindy Chu uh, in Hong Kong who who, you know, as I'm interviewing her, Hong Kong is amidst a great deal of social turbulence. And here she is in her office working on her scholarship, uh, telling me stories about her Mary Knoll professors and how there was one particular Mary Knoll uh, mother superior who went to uh, China and everyone thought she was just this brutal, rigorous, hard woman and uh, how moved Cindy Chu was to find that this, this Mary Knoll sister, American uh, sister, had spent a great deal of time drawing a cockroach in her room because, um, because she had never really seen a cockroach before. Right? So uh, just the, 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 the diurnal, the sort of mundane stories that these scholars care, care about, and Cindy Chu caring so much about this history that she is now trying to corral a, a, a kind of... Um, a difficult group of people to get uh, motivated, that would be scholars, to, to work on uh, very important writing projects. I mean, she's the editor of a series uh, on modern Christianity in China. Uh, she's now putting together a multi-volume series on Catholicism in East Asia uh, and soliciting scholars. So here she is in this difficult context, working diligently to produce scholarship uh, with very limited resources, but she's doing it. So that was quite, quite inspiring. Thinking of Eugenio Menegan and uh, Daryl Ireland's this, this digital project that they're working on. Uh, 
Your work, of course, on the Wuchang Franciscans is inspiring to me. It's inspiring to me uh, largely because lately I've heard of people, in fact, Claudio Von Colani just told me uh, yesterday uh, that she is ga gaining a new interest in, in the Franciscan mission. And uh, people are wanting more about the Franciscan mission. And uh, you're, you're working on a project like this, so fascinating. Um, and, then, and then finally, just I should say that no one is really slowing down. <laughs> that, that was in, inspiring uh, to me. Uh, just the energy in the industry at this time where I keep reading about scholars who are um, tired and, and not working, China Christianity scholars seem to be doing the opposite. They're embracing this moment as a time to write and read and, and, and do research. So gosh, that was a long answer, but those are the, that, that's, that's really um, the things that what have inspired me. find in the process uh, of interviewing them, and maybe this would be important for a listener, did you find that um, there was an intensity of, of focus in the um, way that the, person you were interviewing was going at the material or was it a more of more of a rambling type of storytelling um, was there was there do you think it was it was really thinking out loud or thinking with purpose yeah every uh, examples of all of both of those forms of 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 thinking uh, certainly there were people who had careful notes um, and so they were very directed in their responses um, some of the most felicitous, some of the most delightful responses were those that were unplanned. Uh, and, 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 and so, you know, uh, um, I would say some of the greatest moments during the interview series were the tangents where someone would get carried away. Um, I think uh, uh, something that I found quite exciting was to see some scholars lose a sense of being interviewed. That was really um, quite exciting, uh, even in this format, right, where I'm looking at a screen and you're looking at a screen, uh, uh, even in this format, sort of forgetting that we're looking at a screen, that we're actually together. Uh, and it's, it's almost as if we're sitting at the counter of a bar, and we're having a martini, we're just chatting about our topic. There were those moments that I found to be quite, quite exhilarating. Um, and it was the whole spectrum. Um, you know, the, 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 those scholars who were more focused upon the scholarly endeavor and then those scholars who were clearly, clearly just wanting to reflect upon a life in this field, a life of, of scholarship, a life of relationship with, with China or with the West. Um, but but um, I think the, one of the strengths of this interview series that, that, I would, that I would sort of posit, and that is that uh, uh, there is a great diversity of answers, uh, a great diversity of approaches to thinking about this 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 topic in this field, but also, uh, despite the differences, uh, a very strong commitment to the topic, a very strong commitment to not only the topic but the people, the people ab about whom we study. That was something that was recurrent um, in, in tangent after tangent. Uh, someone would would recall about how when I was in a village meeting these people, when I was in an archive, I met this person, and that uh, that sort of personal encounter was something that marks this particular field in ways that that I find quite quite exciting. Um, another question here: uh, Ten years from now, uh, how do you think? Uh, how will historians in China and throughout the world value these interviews? Right. Um, one always hopes that something like this will will um, have currency in ten years, maybe even in a hundred years. I've had a uh, when I was first introduced to YouTube, I thought YouTube would be something that no one would care about, and and here I am. Finally, you know, I hear about you know I'm intrigued by Carl Jung, for example. Um, what so what do I do? I I go on YouTube and I see if there's a live interview with Carl Jung and. And then it's just, there's something so exhilarating about hearing Jung think out loud or answer questions. Um, and, and so there is something about seeing or hearing, um, seeing the face and hearing the voices of people uh, who, who have made important contributions. And the one thing I would say is, uh, I should say this, uh, I should really underscore this, and that is by no means are the persons in this interview is, is, it, is it comprise all of the important voices? It's, a, it's really, certainly there are many, many more. 
and um, um, budget and time constraints meant that we just had to we had to sort of limit ourselves to a certain number. Hopefully, we'll we'll continue in the future, um, perhaps next summer with a, another series, and that will probably be the last one because of budgetary uh, 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 capabilities. But one of the things that I think is significant is these really are important scholars, and. Uh, one of the things that I think people will see in 10 years, and, and it will be, I think, a benefit to them, is that these are the very foundational, among the very foundational scholars in the field. Um, these are people whose works fill our bookshelves, whose presence we see recurring time and again in books like, well, the, the, the handbook for Christianity in China, the, the volume, second volume that Tiedemann produced that, that you write, have written for, right? So um, uh, Robert Carboneau is a name that we, that we see in, 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 in sort of recurring in our own scholarship. So one of the things I think that will happen and I hope happens is that people actually have a sense of access to these scholars. Um, and, and the other thing I, I should say is that um, the scholars that I interview are, I hope people recognize them as genuinely human. Uh, uh, there's a great deal of laughter and seriousness. There is a great deal of uh, even emotional outpouring. Uh, uh, they're humans who uh, care about this topic, but they're everyone I've spoken with, everyone in the series is extraordinarily driven. Uh, consistently driven. There's something about our field that motivates them vocationally, that they're called to it. So, uh, so uh, and not only are they driven, but I would say everyone is extraordinarily gifted. Um, and, and also, uh, I, I, I would think that um, seeing and hearing from these scholars, and especially hearing them talk about their lives, will preserve a, a memory of this, what I would call the kind of early generation of scholars in the field that is both already established, but still trying to find its footing. Um, it's still trying to find its footing in many ways because now the, the, the scholars who work in this field are not just Westerners as they used to be fundamentally, mostly Westerners, but is expanding to mainland scholars about the history of Christianity in mainland China. That is, is a marvelous trend that I, I see happening. But regardless of where one is conducting research or where one is, is culturally identified, um, uh, in 10 years from now or in 100 years from now, the, the, the people who are interviewed um, are certainly people whose books they will be familiar with or who have read. Um, you know, and I'm thinking of perhaps uh, uh, Professor Richard Madsen, who who was in uh, uh, in China? He, you know, and I didn't even know this, but in 1968, he's he's in Taiwan, and uh, and, and right across the straits is a great deal of historical activity, and 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 he's you know, witness to this in in proximity to uh, uh, the, the the Cultural Revolution. Um, and then he's writing about this, this uh, religious history, this diplomatic history, this cultural history, this religious history in China. It's, it's, it's interviews like those, uh, wherein one can see in the voice of the person uh, who wrote these works or who conducted the scholarship, in that person's voice, uh, one can hear the stories of what it was like uh, to, to conduct the research. Um, you know, Professor Madsen recalls being in mainland China being invited to uh, uh, the cathedral in Tianjin uh, at a time when he thought I could, wouldn't, there, no one would be able to be invited to a, 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 a Catholic ceremony, and uh, uh, realizing later that he was invited because there was some underground church protest that had been planned, and his presence discouraged them from protesting. So you know there was a great deal of machination that was happening. These personal experiences, I think, would not have um, been shared were it not for this interview series. And, and if anything, uh, um, we, we get to peek behind the wizard's curtain and know a little bit about who Oz really is and was in a good way. Uh, and, and, and in my mind, that, I think, is the great benefit of, of this, this series. Um, I have uh, just maybe two questions, because... Uh, even in your experience, and I think talking about all of them, speak with, I think, 
as much candor as you wish, or I guess insight, I guess is the more co proper word. I'm not looking necessarily for candor on this, but insight. Why is this important for Chinese uh, society hearing this? Um, what's the value of this? How should someone who might stumble upon this and listen to this as really a Chinese voice? You know, so many of the people, I guess, are non-Chinese, and it's easy to forget that this is about China, I would think. Could you amplify a little bit on that, on how someone should keep that in mind? Right. Oh, that is a, a very important question, right? Because, um, you know, I'm thinking of my life in grad school and reading Edward Said and, and uh, you know, sort of compelling me to, to justify why I study the East. Um, well, I guess my first point about, about that is that I, when I was chatting with Li Ji, either before the interview or perhaps during the interview, Li Ji, who's a mainland scholar, um, was talking about how in mainland China, the hermeneutic of how we think about Christianity in China is very monolithic. That is, it's imperialist, it's colonialist, it's an, it's an invasionist enterprise, and, uh, uh, and it's enmeshed in a kind of an imperialist agenda. And, and, and what Li Ji said that I found very interesting is she said, well, people think that that's this, this stubborn state narrative. And what she said was, well, Actually, there are many, many people within the agencies of China that basically say, listen, if you provide the data, we'll nuance our narrative, we'll change our, our narrative. So what Li Ji said is, as a mainland scholar, a non-Christian scholar studying Christianity, she wants to provide the data that there's more to this story than a, a kind of a, a rigid narrative of imperialism and, 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 and colonialism. Well, that really, uh, I think, is, is, is a, 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 one of the things that really struck me about this whole series and why this matters to Chinese. Because what, one thing that she uh, emphasized and that others emphasized, and that I would emphasize, is that uh, this history of Christianity in China is not simply a political history, an institutional history. It's not simply a history of, of, uh, of, of, of of, of missionaries there to seek conversion in, in a very in an unnuanced way. But it's a history of friendship, of encounter, of, of tension, yes. Uh, and I think for the Chinese scholar, uh, like Li Ji, who was reading the letters of Chinese Christians writing to uh, Western missionaries, um, for Li Ji, she discovered, wait, there's a great deal of human warmth of human friendship, of, of genuine um, ambition to help, uh, to be uh, a selfish, a, a, an unselfish, selfless uh, participant in a relationship to help. And for her as a Chinese scholar, uh, she really appreciates, and you know, I'm, I'm sure she'll listen to this, uh, but my sense is that she really appreciates this, this, this gaining, appreciates gaining knowledge about the enterprise in ways that go beyond the sort of standard hermeneutic. And then the other thing, um, I think that um, when we, when we uh, meet one another, when we study uh, interactions in this way, we actually, uh, we actually become, uh, well, I mean, it's, it maybe sounds hackneyed, but I think that's, that's a foundation of friendship. Um, the, the Chinese scholars, in my mind, uh, they're going to have insights and understandings that I can never have. Um, I grew up in Oregon, and, uh, and I grew up with a lot of tie-dye and Birkenstocks, and you know, the kind of Oregon wants to be Berkeley in the 1960s. And so that culture really didn't think a lot about China. And, uh, uh, and so uh, what a Chinese person can bring to the table is a, a real cultural um, understanding that, that will see things in ways that we can benefit from, those of us who didn't begin there. So uh, this, in this series, the last thing I would say to answer that question, I think one thing that's very evident in this series is that everyone, all of the scholars, both Chinese and non-Chinese, European, American, wherever, and these interviews were conducted with people all over the world. Um, the one uh, 
trait that marks every single person is a love for China, a, a deep and abiding love for China, a love for the, the culture, the people, um, a love for history. And, uh, and, and I think Chinese scholars will, will very quickly see that um, many or all of the scholars have committed their lives to this study largely because of their love for, for, for China. I'm going to end with a final question. Very, very good. Thank you. I think that was helpful. I'm going to end with a final question to put you, uh, as you were talking about the purpose of this series, uh, very much that you and uh, uh, Joseph Ho from Albion College and you at Whitworth University, uh, sort of in the Christianity uh, in China series uh, organization, tried to put this together. But um, uh, maybe think about this because I'm sure you did, standing in front of a class, getting ready to teach a class, and you put your syllabus together, and uh, you got you know, a freshman in the class who's taken the credit just to get through the humanities sector, and a senior who just needs to sort of brush up against this, and maybe is committed to it, but at least has to do this. And then they find out they got to listen to these uh, interviews, and they're, they're somewhat like, what a waste of time or intimidated, uh, you know, what's, what's, what's the um, purpose that you have at this moment, knowing what you know is in this, to say to the freshmen, like, get involved in this or the senior saying, you know, senior year is coming, but you're not going to have this opportunity. What would you say to the freshman? What would you say to the senior and all the people who fall asleep in class in between? Uh, what, do you, what do you tell them? Uh, to keep them to realize maybe what they have before them that they have to make a judgment on. Yeah. Um, well, as a college professor, and, and, and you teach courses at the university there as well, uh, we all know that students do fall asleep. Uh, and we all know that students do uh, wonder what the, to put it in their words, what the hell am I doing this for, right? Um, yeah, well, one thing that, that I would say, well, to the freshmen, Goodness, I, I guess as I, I have to say, as I get older, I, I wonder more and more what precisely to say to the freshmen. But um, one thing I would say to the, the freshmen and seniors sort of collectively is that when you go into a classroom and you, and you are assigned a book or an article, it's easy to, to sort of forget who, uh, who the author is. It's easy to read a text and then just, it's an assignment. I try to figure out what the heck that thing is, is saying and then, you know, do whatever the professor expects me to do, provide a, a reading essay on the text uh, or something of that nature. Um, I often want my students to actually know the name of their professor. Which, so, so the name of their professor is good, but uh, the name of the authors is, a, is another, another challenge altogether. But here's what I would say. Um, that name is a person. And that person is, uh, is a professor, yes. But guess what? Professors, um, are, are, they've had the same uh, intellectual, emotional, physical challenges and victories that the students have had and, uh, and that they will have. And um, I would say by watching this series, the college student is going to actually hear from the people uh, whose works they're reading if they're that they're studying these topics and um, and there's something really um, I think uh, humane there's something that that that, uh, that that is enlightening about hearing from the the scholar uh, uh, who you're reading uh, and then I think they'll be surprised they'll be quite surprised at at one thing and that is how accessible everyone is. Uh, we often think, I used to think that scholars are in this rarefied place. And I, and I often think, used to think, if you write a book, um, a scholar is, everyone's emailing that person all the time and everyone is you know, calling them. They've written a book. They're famous all over the world. The reality is you write a book and yes, you get some scholarly recognition, but then you're forgotten overnight. And, and you, it's, you, know, you write a book and you, you don't get recognition really and you don't get royalties. So those are the two scholarly conundrums. So I guess what I'm trying to say about that is, is um, most scholars enjoy hearing from people and getting to know people. They're accessible in as much as they love their topic and they love talking about it. So um, one of the things that comes through is how much uh, I think these scholars love what they do and how the students will probably get a sense 
of, oh, this is a human, uh, this person loves her or his topic, and this person is accessible and, and goodness, open about her or his, his life story. So they're accessible, they're real people. Um, and, then, and then I guess the last thing I would say to the freshmen uh, is to the freshmen, I would say, um, it's a good habit to develop, to recognize the humanity of the people of, uh, whose work you, work you read. That's a good habit to develop. And for the senior, um, you're about to go into the to world, and, uh, and, and I, I've always, you know, I've heard my students say, I'm about to enter the real world, and then I always, sort of, I sort of like and don't like that statement because academics is my real world, so I mean, this is the real world, for me anyway. Uh, but uh, uh, for the senior, um, I think, I hope it inspires a sense of joy, a sense of, uh, of, of really uh, re realizing that you can love what you do. And that the, the, every scholar in the series loves what she or he does. And for the senior who's about to look for work, um, I always tell my students, I want you all to be employed. So, you know, if, if you're going to be a nurse or a doctor or a physical therapist or a, a, a banker, whatever you, whatever you do, um, of course, I want them to be China, historians of China. Of course, I want that. But, but I say, no matter what you do, I want you to have something that interests you that you can talk about when you're not in your cubicle or you're not treating patients, something more. And, um, uh, and, and I think this series shows that these are people who love what they do, who, who really love life. And, um, and I hope it inspires seniors to, to be able to embrace that same kind of, uh, of joy, the same kind of intellectual in interest uh, that, 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 that the scholars have. Okay, well, uh, I'll let you add any closing thoughts uh, just to this segment of this interview. Those are the questions, and I appreciate the opportunity for you to reflect on this process. I think it'll be a benefit to uh, sort of bookend or introduce uh, this whole series of uh, um, uh, these scholarly interviews. Any uh, closing thoughts from you on, on just uh, having the opportunity to reflect on this? What has it meant? Yeah, well, Father Carbono, I should say, um, just in closing, how, what a privilege it was. Um, every single person I met, uh, I remember uh, ending the, 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 the meeting, uh, turning the record off, uh, and then going to uh, my wife, Amanda, and just saying, wow, let me tell you a few amazing things about this person. And, 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 and both of us just debriefing about, about, up, up, uh, on this experience. So for me, in any case, that was... Um, it was just a, a great privilege, and uh, uh, it, it really helped me to appreciate my own field even even more. Um, and then, and then, uh, also, I, I, I guess I should say uh, it made me want to see all of these scholars even more, especially in person. I just hope that we all have a chance to uh, gather in person because. Because uh, you know, as much as as I appreciate this technical ability, um, really nothing replaces the the human presence. And all but a few of the scholars I've met personally, and uh, have to say that meeting in person is 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 even a greater privilege, uh, because then you know you have more extended time, and sometimes that martini at the bar changes the course of discussion, right? Uh, and, and then two, um, um, I should just say thank you to you for. Uh, this is your inspiration to 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 conduct this this the ref, this reflection and uh, and and I just want to thank you for taking the time to sit and listen <laughs> uh, to to my ramblings. So thank you uh, for that. And and um, yeah, I guess that's probably my final the last thing I would want to say. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I guess we'll conclude this and uh, go on into our day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh -huh.